Hi friends, Pastor Doug Batchelor. We're about to take you on a little adventure. This would be Country Living Part 2. Now some of you saw our Country Living, the first one, where we took you around the cabin up in Covalo and uh, showed some of the practical things about Country Living. This is actually a different location. And uh, let me explain. About 24 years ago, uh, Karen and I found out about this hunting ranch that was for sale for $100 an acre because it's so remote and it's snowed in in the wintertime, they couldn't sell it, so we bought it. Well, a little more than two years ago, a terrible fire came through and burnt this 100-year-old logging cabin. It was pretty rough, and I decided, well, let's build another cabin. And so with the help of some friends and coming up uh, spare time, we've been building a cabin. Now, we're gonna be talking in this episode, not about country living when agriculture, planting trees, gardens, and that's really not my forte. Karen and I travel so much that we can't do a lot of gardening and farming. But we are going to show you some of the things that you might want to know about how to have convenience in a cabin, country living off the grid with uh, some of the modern conveniences. So let's take a look at the bachelor bed. Here's a few tips on very important basics in mountain living. Get yourself some real boots. If you're out there in tennis shoes, all the foxtails will go down in your shoes and start to annoy you. You can twist your ankle really easy on a rock or piece of wood and sprain your ankle. Uh, if you're ever working with a chainsaw, it's a good idea to have these higher boots to give you ankle support. So for outside work, these are good air rat boots. So one little tip I'll give you is if you're building a cabin on a hill somewhere where you might be exposed to some lightning and some summer thunderstorms, have a lightning rod. I always planned on putting one up here, but the problem is that I hadn't got to it yet and a thunderstorm came along. And uh, last time I was up here, I saw that our expensive stovepipe, it's an insulated stovepipe, that it was blown off the roof and it was down the hill here and the cap which smashed the smithereen. And you see this big gouge here? That was caused from a lightning strike because we didn't get the lightning rod up. Now what you do, it's you just gotta make sure the lightning rod is, you know, a couple feet higher than anything else on the roof. You run, um, you, this is for screwing it in. You attach uh, like copper line and you run that all the way down and you drive a ground in the ground. It's gotta be four or five feet so it attaches the moisture in the ground, even three feet might work. And if lightning hits, it'll always hit this and harmlessly go through the copper wire and into the ground. And this won't happen again. I'm gonna try and get my lightning rod up. Now, when you're building out in the hills, one of the first things you need is water. Fortunately, this spot has several springs and a couple of ponds around it, but it's been used by the Native Americans for probably thousands of years. And in the process of digging out the springs, we found several grinding stones and pestles and weapons. And this is one of the grinding pads that we found not too far away. Some ancient tribe, maybe the Yuki Indians, they used to grind up their acorn mash or uh, manzanita berries or something on these stones. The starting point to having the conveniences off the grid is your power. And the power up here is gonna come from principally one of two places. It'll either be from gas, I'll explain in a little bit, or from the sun. We have, our whole cabin here is powered by these four solar panels. And I bought uh, my whole solar kit after doing some research from a company, I think it's called The Solar Shop. And uh, it's sort of a plug and play process. These panels, we're taping here right now because it's not too hot yet. These panels, the sun is moving over, you can see it's just starting to get on the panels. They will end up sending electricity through this cable and you've got some thick, uh, because uh, DC current, solar panels are DC current, because they have a little bit of line loss, um, you want to have thick copper cables and you don't want your panels too far away from your house because otherwise you'll lose power. And they go in here and they go into the batteries. We'll get there in just a minute. Sunshine is powering all the modern conveniences in there, either live sunshine or through the batteries. Now, something else that I should mention is that this is a temporary setup. I know I'd be getting letters from contractors out there. You normally don't want your solar panels sitting on the ground. 
but we wanted power for our power tools while we were still building. So before we even had the roof on, we had the solar system set up here. It will ultimately be a sanitary installation up on the roof where they're not gonna be in the way and get broken by an animal or something. And it's amazing how light from the sun turns into power. You know, many of the ancient civilizations would worship the sun because they saw that through photosynthesis, all of the life and the food in the world seemed to come from the sunlight. And there is power that comes from light, but it's not the sun we're supposed to worship, it's the sun, S-O-N. Malachi says, the sun of righteousness will arise with healing in his waves. Up here in the hills, we got these cute little four-legged creatures called bears. Now there's two kinds of bears. There's a bear that's on his way to trouble, and then there's the bear that just came from trouble. And so bears can be a problem in the mountains. Uh, they cause problems for your cabin. So we've got a little electric fence. I can touch this now and it's okay. If I turn it on, it starts uh, producing a, a voltage current that goes through here. The bears touch that, it shocks them, and it scares them off. You can hear it clicking now. That means it's on. Turn that off before someone gets hurt. This is a grounded. You can use the same ground you're using for your uh, electric fence that you use for your lightning rod. And this solar, this is all solar. So when I'm not even here, it's charging a little battery you see underneath the porch there. And uh, electric fence, even things like raccoons that might want to explore the cabin, they'll get a little zap and it'll discourage them. We'll take a look at the electric system inside. The solar panels we saw outside, they're taking sunshine, they're producing it into DC current. DC is what you use in a car battery. And so we got positive and negative, it's real simple. Coming in from the sunshine right here, this is this red and this black wire. They're running into two lithium batteries. I've gone to lithium because the old water batteries like this one, you gotta keep watching your water level. They don't have the same lifespan. Uh, they're not near as um, dependable. And they also, they put out like an acid. These have been very dependable. So you got power going into the lithium batteries. This happens to be two 300 amp lithium batteries. And that's power in the whole house, really. So keep that in mind. It doesn't take that big a space. I've left space here to add batteries because never forget, you'll never have enough power. You'll always want more power. I mean, eventually you can run an air conditioner and washing machines and all these things. And you just got to keep adding panels and batteries to do that. So it depends on your budget. But this is a simple plug and play system. I got just the whole thing together. So now the power comes from the batteries. Uh, I don't have this one hooked up. It's a backup for an emergency that a friend gave me from a hospital. So this power, just like a car battery, is going into an inverter. This is the very important unit. This happens to be a 4,000 watt inverter. It inverts or converts the 12 volt DC to 110 volt AC. It comes out here and I know I'm not done with my electric. Hopefully everyone knows the whole cabin is under construction. So, but this way I get to show you things before it's all closed up. So uh, what we've got is AC that is coming out of the inverter and it's running through here into an electric panel that's powering the house. This is a charge controller for the solar. So before the solar power goes into the batteries, it runs in here and runs out of here. What does this do? Saves your batteries. Because if the sun keeps going, your batteries get overcharged, they start burning up. So this always maintains your battery somewhere around 14 volts, which is good actually for a 12 volt battery. And right now it's 13.5 because we've been using it during the night. It's down a little bit. Batteries are 100% capacity. You just press that, this thing lights up, tells you. I leave all summer or all winter. This, I just uh, turn the power off to the house and I uh, won't do it right now, but power off the whole house with one button here. Batteries are still protected. If I need to emergency disconnect the solar because I'm working on it, this is a real quick fuse to just disconnect the solar. I just pull that out. Separates the solar and the batteries if I need to work at anything without getting a big shock. So, nice thing about the inverter is in the winter, if you don't have a lot of sun, but you need to power your house and your batteries start going down, got a generator out back I'll show you in a minute. Start the generator, it's a 7,000 watt generator. The generator runs into the inverter, 
and the inverter now turns into a battery charger. Same unit is taking DC, turns it into 110, but if you put 110 into it, it'll put power back into the battery. So you run your generator for a couple of hours, charge up your batteries, and you can keep running through the winter even though the sun isn't shining. The batteries are one source of power, and the other support source of power in an emergency is a generator, but you don't want to run a generator. This will just charge the battery so you can run your house quietly, And uh, but in just half an hour of running this, it charges up the batteries, maybe a little longer, depends on how far down they are. These new generators, I've actually got a remote wireless starter and stopper in the house. I press a button, it starts it. I press a button, it stops. You don't even have to come outside. And you just place these things. Eventually, I'll put it down here where it puts some insulation around a case, protect it from the weather, and it's a lot quieter when it runs. You don't hear it in the house if you just put a little insulation uh, around it. And the other thing is this generator will run on either gasoline or propane. And right here by Camden, you've got two propane tanks. So you just switch. If you want to go to propane, you switch over to propane. Uh, which brings me to the next point. We can come over here. Even way out here in the hills, they deliver propane in very remote places. And we get that filled once every couple of years and it will run all of the gas appliances. And so uh, that's just a real, uh, real saver. Another very important and practical aspect to country living is what do you do about your bathrooms and keeping things sanitary? Well, you need to put in a septic tank. And so we put in a 500 gallon septic tank here and then we've dug lines that go down the hill. For, fortunately, this earth, what they say, perks good. It means the water drains well from it. So we have a leach line that goes down the hill. We dug with a, a little bobcat backhoe. And we didn't need a really big septic tank because our gray water, meaning the water coming from your kitchen sink and your showers and your, your um, bathroom sinks, we just run that down the hill. You'll see a white pipe coming out of the hillside right there. That water just, it runs down and uh, it makes the grass green. It never hurts anything. It's just your gray water. Makes this last a lot longer. And so by separating your gray water from your solids, you don't need an enormous septic system. It's uh, plenty for a home with a couple of people. So some of the more practical things people want to know about the conveniences off the grid, just they're wanting to know, do you have things like a refrigerator? Can you keep things cold? And this is a refrigerator. They you, actually, I think they make them in uh, China. They got the design from Sweden, but it's pretty dependable. We've got one like this. We've had at our other place for over 30 years and it still runs. You can switch it between gas and power. You got lots of batteries and backup power. You can just switch it back and forth down here. You can control the temperature and um, yes, it freezes and uh, keeps things nice and move. I'm going to stand right here. Ah, oh, this is where I'm going to spend the day. This is nice. It's a warm day up here. So then because you've got the power, so you got your outlets around the kitchen here, you've got a microwave, you can microwave things. You've got um, power. So I think in another video I show people, it's pretty cool. We've got an ice maker here. I didn't buy it, but one of the hunters that came up to uh, hunt up here, he left an ice maker and we use it because when the panels are putting out during the day, once the batteries are charged, it's just wasted power. Stove runs on gas also. So you've got uh, three things that run on gas. You got your refrigerator, you've got your stove for cooking, and you'll see this, it uses electric start so you don't blow the house up. And the other important element is hot water. And uh, I'll let you stick your camera through the wall there because we haven't finished building this, but it, it all works. This is just a really nice, it's a Renai hot water system and it uses gas to heat the water. I'll turn on some hot water here in the bathroom and the gear come on and it'll make as much hot water. It keeps it nice and even. So if you're in the shower, it's not going off and on getting hot and cold. Had a great shower a few weeks ago. It makes a little noise, but this will be in a closet. We're gonna be uh, insulating this and shutting the door so we won't hear it very much. You come around here and see some of the modern conveniences. Even though we're a thousand miles from, not quite a thousand miles, but we are probably 10 miles from the next neighbor. And I bet we're uh, 50 miles from the next town. Uh, we've got, you know, shower, sink, toilets, just like you're in the city and it's comfortable. 
Now the neat thing is these appliances that run on gas, the refrigerator, the hot water heater, the stove, uh, we have that filled up once every two years and it would probably easily go three years on one filling. And uh, it's just real low maintenance using gas for those appliances. We used to use wood to try and heat our water. You don't want to do that in the summertime. It just gets really hot. It's really energy inefficient. Every home needs an upper room. You know, the Bible talks a lot about upper rooms. It's an upper room where Jesus had the Last Supper. It's an upper room where the Holy Spirit was poured out. It's an upper room where Elijah resurrects a boy. It's an upper room where Elisha resurrects a boy. Dorcas is resurrected by Peter in an upper room. So we wanted to have an upper room. And um, we'll come up here because it'll explain what do we do with communications. Fortunately, you can look out the windows out here. Go ahead, Camden, give them a shot. We are up on a mountaintop. Hopefully that didn't just totally wash out on you. And because we're on a mountaintop, we get a repeater. So even though we're out in the middle of nowhere, we have cell phone service. I call Karen, talk to her just like she's next door. Not only that, internet for work. You can see I've got my computer out. I was doing some work writing this morning. And uh, we have the new Starlink system. Elon Musk has this uh, Starlink system. We got one because we were so far out, we qualified. You've got your cable, you got your wireless transmitter, and you got your dish. And I'll show you that here. You just kind of plug it in, you download the app. That little dish I got on the route, set that up, it automatically finds its location. You'll see it's, it goes through some uh, gyrations and then it starts to move and track. And you just turn on the, the Starlink app. And uh, let me see if I can find that for you. Yeah. It tells you where you're at and uh, your statistics and you set it all up from your phone. And uh, you can set up a password and everything. We have wireless within 50, 100 feet of the cabin in any direction. And it's not as fast as if you'd have in a city, but it is much faster than when we had satellite wireless with like HughesNet or Viasat. Starlink is much faster. It's so great, we're connected with the world. You come up here, you can do some work and be surrounded by God's creation. So one of the most important things you need if you're gonna be living up in the hills is you need water, good water. And you need enough water. And uh, the Bible says Jesus is the living water. What's really nice is if you can have a spring of water that comes up out of the ground. That's why Jesus told the woman at the well that the gospel will be like water that springs up and flows over. And we're fortunate in that we've got a good spring here. If you follow this white pipe, you'll see a green spot up there. And the water, we've got this all dug out nice and sanitary. It's covered with gravel and this permeable fabric. So we've developed it the way you should develop a spring. We capture that water and got a much bigger pipe than we need. And the water runs down into the tanks. And both of the tanks here, um, it runs into the bottom of one tank, but the tanks are connected at the bottom. And uh, that keeps the water level the same in both tanks because of the siphon effect. So whenever the water is halfway in one tank, it's halfway in the other. You can see that the tanks are full and running over right now because it's still morning here and we haven't turned on the pump to pump the water from here to the tank that supplies the house that's just up the hill. And uh, this spring probably puts out oh, maybe 2,000 gallons a day. If you get one gallon a minute, you'll have 1,400 gallons a day is, is the rule of thumb, which is plenty for household use. You wash your dryer, showers, all that. But if you can have a garden, you need a pretty good storage or a better supply than that. But uh, let's take a look at the pump and see how that all works. So the reason we have to go through the trouble of pumping the water up the hill is because you can see there's the cabin over there and here's the spring, the pond here, we're at the spring level. Uh, it would not run, water doesn't run uphill very well. We originally, this spring used to supply the old hunting cabin that burnt down and that was down there by the pond. But we wanted to put the new cabin up where there's a much better view. But hence, we've got to get the water up above the cabin. So um, here we've got the switch for the Grand Froze pump. It's real simple. Off and on, and you got two ways. You can power it from the sun, 
that's a solar, and you can power it with a generator. Because let's suppose it's cloudy for several days, your water level goes down, what do you do for water? Got a simple old 2000 watt generator here, we crank this up, run it until it just runs out of gas, it'll pump you know, a thousand gallons of water up in the tank, so that's your backup. But um, yeah, and I've got a timer here, so if I want, this will come on twice a day, because after it pumps out what's in the tank, then uh, it fills up again in one day, sun is still shining, long days in the summer, and I can have another setting where at three o'clock it'll come on and pump for an hour. Pump more water. So we end up with 3,000 gallons up there and you get plenty of water for what you need. And all I gotta do is turn this on. It'll do it automatically or manually, but we'll do it manually, see if the pump comes on. You'll hear a clicking noise over here. There it goes. Click, 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 hum, hum, hum. And it starts to wind up and build power. You get a little closer, you might even hear the audio of it here. So here's the main water supply for the house. It's this 3,000 gallon tank. And uh, it's all scuffed up because one year it had no water and it blew down the hill and got scratched up and we had to haul it back up here, which was a very interesting process. But uh, they're pretty durable. And uh, so the water comes in the bottom of the tank and the pressure just pushes it up. And then as we need it, the water goes out. And the nice thing about that is bears love to pull pipes when they hear water running through them. And this keeps the bear, the pipes where they're not kind of on the outside of the tank. Did I mention there's two kinds of bears? Anyway, so if I want to know what the water level is, I got a couple ways. One is, that's a, that's a dead sound. Water, 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 water. Hollow, no water, water. On the other side of the tank, it's got marks. And right now we've probably got 2000 gallons of water in here. And you can see that the tank is up above the cabin. We have the same pressure that you would have in your normal house, probably 35, 40 pounds water pressure, fine for showers and sink and everything. Works great. So one of the keys to having just a beautiful piece of property is having water. So as often as I can, I try to create year-round water spots, ponds, small lakes if you have enough water. And because this place had a natural draw in it, and you see the spring up the hill where we had our uh, pump and our solar panels, there was water in the hills here. And there's some clay in the ground that'll hold water. So we got a bulldozer and we built a dam and uh, it fills up in the winter and it stays full. Well, it keeps water all year long. It goes down a little bit at the end of the summer. We got fish in it. We got some bass in it. They help keep the mosquitoes down. And this vegetation around the edges and the water brings in the deer and the wildlife. And so uh, just makes a real nice spot. And when it gets hot sometimes, if no one's looking, I jump in. So one of the tragedies of the fire that uh, came through here a couple of years ago, by the way, it was the biggest fire in California history called the August Fire. And this property uh, suffered some of the results of that. But uh, there's still a lot of trees left, but a lot of trees died. But we brought a mill up and we began to mill some of the lumber. We bought the posts, posts are treated posts. But these boards that were making a new fence, because there's cows up here sometimes, keep the cows out, we'll have gates there. And all the lumber that you see around the porch of the house, that was all milled for this. Saves a lot of money if you can mill some of your own lumber. If you have your own trees, and especially if the trees die because of the fire, don't wait too long before the bugs get in. Mill them up, make lumber out of it. So friends, this might help you get a little perspective how far out in the hills we are. We thought we'd take a little ride along the ridge up here and get into some cooler weather because it's a hot summer day. That's how you get air conditioned in the hills. You try to go up where it's cooler or get some shade by the water. But um, we're not suggesting that everybody needs to get a place that's so remote. Uh, it is a good idea probably in the last days and just in the times we're living in to not be living down in metro areas where if they run out of food and they run out of fuel, people we've seen get a little bit rambunctious and it may not be safe. It's nicer if you can be in more rural areas Day's gonna come where there'll be religious laws that are gonna restrict our freedom. And at some point, we're just gonna have to head out to very remote places uh, where God will feed us like he did the Israelites and like Elijah.
So man originally was created and placed in a garden. That is clearly God's design for the ideal environment for men to be in uh, nature, surrounded by the things that God made. All of us are influenced by the things and the people that surround us. That's why it's important for everybody to try and take some time, get out in nature as far as possible, and um, ultimately we are changed by beholding. God speaks to us through his word, through providence, and he also speaks to us through the book of nature. And so um, it is possible to still have some of the conveniences that we enjoy in modern society and still be in a place where you're surrounded by the things that God made. Get to know them better, friends.